The movie begins in Woken, England, in 1905. George and his live in partner, Amy, are looking into a telescope gazing at Mars. The local astronomer Ogilvy, who Amy works for, takes a picture of it and gives it to them to welcome them into the neighborhood. In the photo, they see something on the planet's surface, but Ogilvy theorizes it as a volcanic eruption. The next day, George is a struggling journalist striving to prove to his boss that he can do more than general research. So, he negotiates to interview his brother on an article to give them an inside scoop regarding an attack on a British vessel losing the lives of 12 men aboard, rumored to be the Russians. When he interviews his brother, Frederick, he only gives what was given to the press earlier. That night, a bright flash of light gets followed by a small earthquake. As they go out and investigate, they see a line of smoke in the sky. Oblivy goes to investigate, follows the end of the line of smoke, and sees that something has crashed. He further explores it the next day, along with George and Amy. On the way there, they see a trail of burnt trees and smoke while George interviews Ogilvy about it. He theorizes that it must be a comet with similar characteristics. It starts to tremble as they approach what they believe to be a shooting star. George suggests bringing in the army, but Ogilvy tells him not to, as he doesn't want uniformed men to clog up the place. So. Amy suggests that George send a telegram to his boss to write a paper about it. Still, Ogilvy tells them that the telegraphs are out, so George has to go in and say to them face to face. He takes a picture of them in front of the comet before he leaves. As it happens, his boss isn't interested in this story and wants more details on the attack from Russia. An annoyed George leaves work while Ogilvy and Amy continue to dig with the help of the local men. Amy asks Ogilvy if it could be from Mars, remembering the photographed eruption, then, Oglivy answers that the chances of it being from Mars are a million to one. As he approaches the comet, it rumbles again and a giant crack appears. In the meantime, George visits his ex-wife Lucy and asks her to sign his divorce papers. She scolds him for his decision to leave her and swears that if he wants to marry again, he can do so when she dies. He grimly returns to the train after his fruitless ordeal and returns to the dig site. At the dig site, the comet rumbles again. While Ogilvy hears mechanical whirs coming from the comet, he believes that something must be inside. It attracts more and more spectators, as well as the royal astronomer. The local police have come and guarded it. Soon, George comes to their house and asks their housekeeper, Mary, where Amy is. She has been out all day, presumably at the dig site. Mary asks whether the rumors of them discovering a bomb are true, but George assures her it isn't. He asks her to wait at the house in case Amy comes home, as he quickly goes to the dig site. Later, George arrives at the dig site and asks Ogilvy where Amy is, while they watch as the cum attracts more and more people. Still, the big rock rumbles more and more and its rock-like exterior is fallen off, revealing the metal interior of a black sphere. The royal astronomer approaches and touches it, revealing the surface covered in a black goo. The metal sphere starts to turn until it rises from the ground, shocking everyone. The black goo on the royal astronomer's hand starts to combust until the fire swallows him. George and the others try to help but back away as the spinning sphere throws the black goo around. Then, it explodes upon contact, making everyone run away to take cover and leave the site. The metallic sphere finally burned itself off, but something was still unseen on the site. Rushing back home, Amy and George watch as more objects fall from the sky. In the wake of the devastation, George heads back to the site to try and find Ogilvy. However, he's nowhere to be found. The army has taken control of the site, collecting the corpses and pushing the story that a forest fire caused their deaths. Amy heads to Ogilvy's lab and sees the various photos of Mars, recording the explosion they saw. She sees traces of something that doesn't look like debris from a volcano. However, she only takes a little bit of time and meets with George. They both report that there's no sign of Ogilvy. Suddenly, they hear explosions coming and soldiers running and telling everyone to clear the houses. Blasts come from something unseen, so they run to their home for safety. Still, their house also gets shot at, and Mary, their housekeeper, gets buried under the rubble. George and Amy attempt to flee on a stray horse, but they stop as Amy sees their dog, and George tries to catch their dog. Benny while they avoid the blasts. 
In the ensuing chaos, Amy and George get separated, and they finally see what's causing the blasts, which is a machine. The giant mechanical behemoths are towering over the houses, roaring mechanically. George yells at Amy to head to Frederick's, and then he gets knocked down under some rubble. Later, George climbs out of the rubble, and he sees the destruction that happened in Woking. Meanwhile, Amy arrives and forms Frederick of the attack and is looking for George as they plan to meet there, but he isn't. She also tells him that she's pregnant with George's child. In the future, in post-apocalyptic England, Amy is with her child, a war-weary survivor struggling to find George. The desolate ruins of London stretching on in the distance got revealed. After reading about it from a pamphlet he saw, Amy's son asks her what the great victory was. She tells him that it was hard and they lost a lot. A priest interrupts them to remind Amy that her husband will come back. Going back to the present, George goes to their house looking for any sign of Amy. He doesn't find her, so he writes a letter to her and leaves it on the mantle. Someone calls out to him outside the house. He arms himself with a knife and meets the person, and it's the soldier he met earlier. Together, they are walking around the town looking for survivors when they hear a baby's cries. Still, they also hear the mechanical sounds from the tripod war machine. He decides to look for the baby, but the soldier pulls him to cover and he hides from one of the monstrous machines as it towers over them. They hear a blast and the baby's cries stop. Meanwhile, Amy and Friedrich tell the Minister of War what happened. She explains to them that it must have come from Mars, showing the picture she got. She convinces them that they should attack the metal creatures before it reaches London and cause mayhem to the city. Evading the threat for now, they manage to make it to the nearby town, where they find a sergeant major. He's looking for volunteers to fight for their country against the metal creatures. He threatens George, so he's forced to enlist in the army. He reluctantly joins them as they head off to the site of the second crash landed object, which is in a deep pond. George watches as they fruitlessly bombard it with cannons and gunfire. Despite destroying its shell, the actual creature remains untouched and begins to rise, eviscerating some of the soldiers. The soldier asks for help, but he uses the opportunity to escape to safety. At the same time, Frederick and the minister address London and tells them he has nothing to be concerned about what's happening. Ironically, the creatures arrive in London moments later forcing Amy and the others into underground tunnels to get away. The creatures release a black gas that poisons the people, killing all those inhaling it and the minister. Amy and Frederick outrun poisonous gas, which seeps through the vents. They return to the surface, where Amy watches in horror as bodies pile up and down the streets and the survivors shuffle out of the city. In the future, the priest tells Amy that there's someone from Woken, and it might be her husband, giving her hope and joy it might. Later, George and other refugees watch on helplessly from the city's outskirts, and the refugees plan to head to the coast. An old lady, Mrs. Elphinstone, drinks from a well and then offers him a cup, and he reluctantly does so to quench his thirst. Chaos engulfs the southern shores of England as the survivors scramble aboard rowing boats set for Dunkirk, but they only allow women and children George frantically looks for Amy among the refugees while Friedrich tries to get information from the officers. An officer tells him that the creatures have wiped out the cities up north, Manchester, Birmingham, and Liverpool. The army can't do anything as their weapons are useless against the creatures. Frederick forces Amy to board a boat to protect herself and her future child. He believes George is dead, so he must protect her as his younger brother did. The machines will soon make their way to the coast. While George and Amy reunite and run down the beach away from the overturned machines, they save a girl trapped between them. Meanwhile, the Navy begins a counteroffensive. In the future, Amy waits for the person, who she believes is his husband, but it's Ogilvy, who happens to have survived the attack after all this time. Nevertheless, she's happy, and together they discuss what happened and the future implications for the country. Ogilvy believes that the visitation from the creatures, the Martians, is just the first. They only sent the machines to start making Earth again in the image of Mars. The black gas spread like a virus, which grew into red weeds and red shards emerging from the ground. Unless they can stop it, it will soon not be their planet anymore. In the present, Amy, George, and the others find shelter in a house. At the same time, one of their fellow survivors, Mrs. Elphinstone, is coming down with a severe illness, 
which they believe must be typhoid fever. Moments later, they hear creatures coming and hide from one of the machines that appear to be outside their window. So, they close the door and bolt it, but it seems something else is in the house with them. In the future, during the desolation of England following the Martian invasion, the priest tells the people that the church grounds are the only hallowed place left where the red weed doesn't affect the harvest. At the same time, Amy stares glumly into the distance as she realizes that humankind is hanging on by a thread. In the present, Amy awakens at 9 o'clock, with Frederick commenting that the day hasn't dawned as the thick clouds of black smoke cover the sun as the thick clouds of black smoke cover the sun. As he and George step outside with Amy, they watch in horror as the remnants of the monstrous metal machine have fallen like a metallic gravestone by the side of the house. With the door unlocked down the hall, Frederick and Amy look for food and water, but they appear to be stalked by an alien creature lying in the depths of the basement. They discover the bodies of the refugees scattered all over the roof. However, before they can continue, the creatures mechanically roar their way into the room before it kills the sickly old lady, sucks its blood, and drags the body outside. Amy continues to worry about the future, watching her son, George Jr., condition worsening because he's starving and typhoid fever is deteriorating. Then, she decides to team up with Ogilvy to discuss what to do next. Ogilvy tells her that every time he watches the planet Mars for a few hours this time, it's closer to Earth now. In the present, Frederick boards up the room to hide them from the creature, believing their strength in numbers is a possible advantage. George theorizes that the alien invasion results from Britain dominating the world. Frederick screams at George, telling him to get a grip. They move to try and ambush one of the aliens, but another alien creature appears behind the little girl, killing her. They leave the house, and Friedrich throws firebombs at one of them, but it does no harm, so it kills him while George and Amy embrace them as they take refuge inside another building. In the future, Amy's theory is that sickness from them, typhoid fever, causes the aliens to die. As she approaches the priest, she and Ogilvy try in vain to convince him to let her experiment on the sick. With syringes and hoses, they spray the sickness in the following fields to try and test the theory. In the past, George begins to go mad, suffering the effects of typhoid after being cooped up inside. He tries to convince Amy to let him out to try and talk to the creatures, and this causes her to slap him across the face to snap him out of it. George has had enough and sacrificed himself to save Amy, and she can run away. They raise a glass to their victory and discuss their options for moving forward. The experiment became successful partly because of the blood that George Jr. donated. The following day, they report their findings to the priest, typhoid being responsible for the death of the red weeds. Later, she finally tells Ogilvy about what happened to George. He was going mad because of the typhoid fever and tried to talk to the alien creatures, but he failed and got dragged away. The incident distracted the alien enough to let Amy run away, and she still feels guilty that she didn't do enough to stop him. Ogilvy assures her that it wasn't her fault, but he was mad from the disease, and if she didn't run away, she wouldn't have had her son George Jr. If she didn't have her son, they wouldn't have found a cure to the red weeds. Later that night, Amy tells her son a story as she talks about the world she used to know. After putting her son to bed, she notices a solitary green shrub rising from their experiment. The movie ends as she stares at the sky with the clouds moving, finally revealing the sun, symbolizing that there is hope.